All right, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning the damn house down so we can rebuild it twice a week, every Monday, and every Thursday morning. You don't just get to hear me, you get to hear our fantastic guests give you the ability to continue to be a champion in construction, grow your business. Be a better person, be a better husband, a better father, a better boss. And then at the end of the day, understand your business. I am super, super excited for today's episode. We have another rock star guest that I know is going to bring value to your business. Scott, it is great to have you here today. Ron, it is great to be here. I like the energy. I like the passion. Let's keep that going. Rock and roll, man. That's what it's all about. This podcast, I started roughly just over a year, well, March, so a year and a quarter ago with them, with, and it has become like my passion project. Like, I love it. This is one of my favorite things I do, and it's really, we're just here to help change the mindset around the construction industry, and how do we do that? By helping the guys that are in the industry. So why don't you take some time, tell all the construction champions out there a little bit about yourself, what got you here to today, what you, what excites you about the construction industry? Yeah, I love it. Uh, so I'm the son of a steel worker. I grew up in, in, you know, steel city, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, first job was out mowing grass. The first real job was on a roof, uh, <laughs> hauling shingles and, you know, that weighed more than I did. You know, I was a scrawny little, like, whatever, 100 pounds soaking wet. But I found a way to get them up the roof and, uh, and, and realized pretty early on, it's not what I want to do with my day-to-day -day living, but I fell in love with the people who do. And, uh, and you know, there were, uh, it was a few years where I, I did a couple other things, um, but as I started building my consultancy, helping businesses to scale, I, I found myself increasingly back in that world, working with roofers, working with residential contractors, work, working with cement contractors. And uh, the, thing that I, the thing that I love about it is they'll just tell you like it is, right? Like there is no BS in this world. I, I love it. I, you just say it and let's move on. Uh, the, I think the challenge, though, that's so hard uh, and that the, the construction world has as I don't know if it's a disadvantage uh, because you can turn around and make it an advantage. But one of the challenges the construction world faces is you got to do stuff in the real world. Right. If you don't manage well and you don't order well, the stuff's not at the job site when you get there. You know, the tech companies like they can kind of they get away with a lot, you know, because it's all digital. It's all whatever. Oh, yeah, we'll get that to you next week. So be it. But like when it's raining and you don't have a roof on a house, that's a problem. And so, uh, again, one of the challenges of this world is the direct immediate results that are in front of us, getting the roof back on before the rain hits, getting the walls up before, you know, the electricians can come in and do their work. But the reality of that, it, it makes it really hard to focus on the stuff that we can't see. Right? How do you how do you focus on the stuff that's not urgent? Right? Things like I've heard you talk on the show about understanding your numbers, uh, building a leadership team, moving out of the technical doing role into leading others to do it. And so, while there's this distinct advantage and there's this nobility that comes from being able to see the work of our hands, it's also a challenge, and it can lead us, especially in this space, to think of the work that we do as the building aspect of what we do and neglect the real work that a founder needs to do, which is building their company. Hmm. Awesome, man. Well, I am definitely excited to have this conversation today. And I, you know, I like to say it's like a drug. When you get around and have spent any time in the construction industry, it's the best people you will ever meet, the best people you will ever work with. And it's really hard to escape. Like it, it would keep pulling you back in because it truly, like you said, there's no BS. It's yeah. just like the construction industry. And it's a great group of people that bring the construction industry to life. So 100%. I'm excited to ask you the million dollar question and really dive into it. And that is what makes a construction champion? 
what makes a construction change? It's a fantastic question. I uh, heard it in a couple. Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who have brought some really great answers to that question. So here's mine. Uh, I, I think the, the thing about that question is that uh, you have to start the answer with it depends. It depends on, uh, on a number of things, but I think more than anything, it depends on the question of when. When are you in your journey as a construction champion, as the founder of a business, as the owner or operator of a business? Because what makes a construction champion at 500,000 is the very thing, same thing that will get in your way at 5 million. Mm. And so one of the things that we have a tendency to do is kind of define that success as a static thing, right? It means that I have to be the best roofer, you know, in you know, the county or, or in the state or in the country, or, or I've got to be the best uh, project leader, or I've got to be the best CEO, or I've got to be the, there are so many ways that you can answer that. You bring 10 people into the room, they can all answer it in 10 different ways. But uh, I think what pulls all of that together is that when we answer it right, we recognize the season that we're in and how we need to show up in that season. And what prevents a construction champion from either staying a champion or becoming the champion that they really want to be is that they get stuck with the wrong definition. They get stuck with a definition that worked for them in the past, or they get stuck with a definition that they borrowed from someone else in the future, and they don't show up with the definition that they need right now. Mm. I love that because we can become very, oh, what's the, I don't, I can't quite think of the word that I'm thinking of, but like, just like, this is how it's supposed to be, or this is where I'm at. And then just, we make it very generalized, I guess would be the best word for the construct. Like it's just this generalized area, but that's not going to work long-term. You have, you have to be able to, it's just continued growth as a business grows, grows, you have to continue to grow. So how, I mean, how do we get, how do we move past that? How do we start to understand that, it's not just where I'm at now, but it's also where I'm going. Yeah. Here's the here's the problem with that, because I think most people would get that where you are and where you're going are two different things, right? We mentally uh, understand that. Maybe emotionally that's a little harder, but we kind of get it. But the challenge of it is, again, it, it's when do those things happen? Right, because if you're trying to be a CEO in the corner office and you have zero employees, that's not going to work very well, right? So you can't grab onto that definition too soon. You can't just jump to the next stage, right? You can't just from day one have a company that you own and not run, right? If you're going to build it from the ground up, there are different stages that happen along the way, but when do you progress from one stage to another? When do you have to move from one definition to another? When do you have to change how you show up as a construction champion to stay at the top of your game? There's nothing that tells us that the stage has changed. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's take the leadership journey of one of the guys on your cruise, right? Uh, he comes and take me, the, the roofer, uh, you know, for the summer, right? The low <laughs> man on the totem pole. Uh, he comes in, works his ass off, like, and just hoofs it. And we say, hey, this guy's, this guy's got it. Like, he's got that it factor. He's not going to be in this labor position for long. Let's move him. Now he's a project lead, right? Or he's a supervisor on, on site. And we give him a new title. It comes with some new responsibilities. And here's the really important thing. Someone other than that star player told them that the game was changing. Their job is not to see how many shingles they can get up on the roof anymore. Their job is to see how they can get their whole crew working together at peak performance and capacity. And that's a really hard uh, transition to make. It's hard to move from being great at what you do to helping others be great at what they do, right? That's a hard transition to make. But the employee on your crew, the team member in your, your company has the advantage of someone else telling them that it's time to change. Does that make sense? There's an oh, external it, it validation that, that the game has changed. Well, a founder, go, you know, a, a, someone who starts a construction company, residential, commercial, or otherwise, they go through that same pro progression. They go from being the one who does the work to managing a group of people who do the work. When does that happen? Does it happen when you hire one person other than you? 
Is it when you hire five people other than you? When should you be getting out of doing the work and someone else be getting into doing the work? We get that it's eventually, but we don't recognize it when it happens. Mm. And so the, the problem that keeps so many of us stuck is that it's an invisible journey. It's an invisible transition. And in an industry that is very much defined by its visible work, that's hard to accept and acknowledge. I, that's one of the best ways I've ever heard that put. They just that invisible because it really is like you hear it all the time. It's like, I don't want to come out of the field too soon. But what ends up happening is a lot of guys stay in the field too long. Yeah. And it caught both cause a lot of damage to the business that you then have to rebuild. And I think I, I love that terminology where you're talking. It's this invisible thing because when you pull an employee, you have that conversation with them. You move them into that leadership role. It's not invisible for anybody. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. But as the owner, the 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 one that runs the company, who there's nobody there to pull you and say, now's the time. So I, I love that. That is a great analogy on that. And, and so that I, I've seen this happen so many times. I've helped start uh, around now 20,000 different organizations, right? In just about every industry you can think of, businesses, nonprofits. And, and so the, I, I, I can't take any credit for that. I just kind of happened into a couple of things worked right. And I got this wonderful opportunity very early in my career to see this thing play out at scale. And when you see the same thing happen in one industry and the next, and you see this these patterns start repeating again and again, uh, I was able to start connecting the dots. I was able to, to start saying, okay, here are the demarcation points. Here are the milestones. Here's when it shifts and why it shifts and how we need to change as we do. And so uh, in my latest book, what I did is I took that and, and I documented, that's a terrible word for it, but I, I, I outline all seven stages. It's an awful word for it. Everyone just, you know, just they skip to the next episode. No documentation, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I defined all seven of those steps and and I made them visible. So you don't have to guess when it's happening anymore. You don't have to guess when you've changed from one stage to another, and you don't have to guess at what need you need to do when you get there. And so by outlining all seven of these stages, uh, I didn't want it to be this kind of abstract thing that was like some cool book that, you know, frankly, no one in the construction industry is going to take the time to read. And so what I did was to make it easier to grab hold of, to give us something concrete that we can look at that helps us you know, navigate these different steps. I compare every one of those stages to a, a position in a sports team kind of infrastructure, if you will, from the trainee on the sideline to the, the Hall of Famer and everything in between. And what it does is it gives us this mental picture of, hey, when you start the business, you're starting in star player mode. You've got to be at least good at what you do. Maybe not the greatest, but you've got to be at least good at it. Uh, if you don't know how to put a roof on without it leaking when you leave, you're not going to build a great roofing business, at least not anytime soon. So, and, and most folks, again, in the construction industry, they don't really struggle in this stage. Uh, you'll see a lot of them will, will get out there, they'll start their business, and they'll get it up off the ground where at least they're making you know, their income back in a, a relatively short period of time. It's not without failure or difficulty, but most of them are, are technically sound when they start their business. But what happens is when we don't shift from star player to captain on the field, we're going to have a bunch of guys standing around saying, hey, what do I do? Right. And then we're going to get furious because we got a bunch of guys standing around saying, what do I do? You know, and so they're thinking, hey, just point me in the right direction. I'll go get it done. And you're thinking, what's wrong with these people? Right. Like, what, you know, what's wrong with these people? Uh, they don't think like me. They don't take ownership like I do. They don't leave a job site like I do. The, the folks that you're going to hire are different than you. This is particularly true for founders. It's also true for owners. They're not wired like you, and you don't want them to be wired like you because that would be chaos, right? That would just be absolutely crazy. And so by, by being able to recognize, hey, I'm moving into this place. I've got you know a handful of employees around me. They do need to be told what to do. Maybe not every step, every single time. That would be inappropriate, but they do need to be directed. They do need to be managed. And we can make the transition from star player on the field to captain on the field, and it makes a world of difference. I, that's 
I love it. But you get, see, I'm a founder. I've, I've been in the construction industry for 15 years and now I have a software company and like what you're talking about just in general is one of the biggest holdups that people have is they go out and they make hires based on like their selves. Like, Oh, this person there, we're, we're, we're like two peas in the pod. This is going to be awesome. We're going to crush it. And that is the opposite of what you want to do. I mean, I, a decade ago fell into this trap and what you when you talk about chaos like that it is a shit show like two one ron news bombs awesome two ron news bombs oh <laughs> you better have a cleanup crew coming in because <laughs> it's going to get interesting but as like as i'm growing and scaring my current gut, like i understand that like here's the stuff i suck at I need to hi- I need to hire and move people into these roles as fast as I possibly can because I am the roadblock because I suck at it. And in the construction like in the construction industry and in business, like we can lose track of that as we're hiring these initial employees because we think I just need to bring in people that are like minded, just like me, because that's how we're going to grow this. They're going to get out there. They're going to get it done. But you're going to have a bunch of the same problems at mass scale. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So here, here's what's so hard about this stage. There's two things. One is that there are four different types of people that you can hire for your company. There, we call them visionaries, operators, processors, and synergists. And three of those are problematic for your company. You don't want them, right? Especially in these early days. So of all the people that are out there that are related to you or that have a pulse, usually the two criteria for hiring people at this stage, uh, of all of them, you know, no more than 25% of them are who you're looking for. And so what happens is we go out and we hire mostly the wrong people and they need mostly the wrong things from us to manage them well. And we intuitively get, hey, I, I don't have time for that, right, for some of it. But then what we do, we throw the baby out with the bathwater and we don't take the time that we need to manage the right type of person well, right? And they're not like us. They're not wired like us. They are different from us. But on the flip side, just because they're different from us doesn't make it right either. So we've got to know who to hire. We want to hire what we call operators, folks who will walk through walls to get stuff done, right? Now, the wonderful thing for uh, folks in the construction industry is that they abound, right? It's one of the richest uh, areas for, for operators. Uh, you, you look at a lot of other, other industries, one of the biggest problems that they have is a, a lack of op- that operator style, those operator leaders. But in the construction industry, that's, that tends to not be a challenge once we know what we're looking for. Now, here's what happens is this thing keeps progressing, especially if we really struggle to, to start getting in people into their roles, to learn that basic set of management skills that we need, uh, is we start to shift into this mode where where we've got other people to do most of what needs to get done right you might not you, you might not even be at a, a, a site so i'm fast forwarding years let's say you've got a salesperson who goes in they they estimate it they win the deal uh you've got uh your you know uh your foreman your contract you got everyone else who who's necessary for getting the house built and uh, at some point you don't even need to be there necessarily But what happens every time something goes wrong, right? What happens every time sales dip or what happens when there's a problem on the job site? Who comes flying in on their great white chariot but the founder, right? And and they 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 are they just get into this mode where it's like, I'm the only one who can figure this out. Right? I'm the only one who can now and, and they'll usually get stuck on something. I'm the only one who can sell, I'm the only one who can deliver, I'm the only one who can design this thing this way. I'm the only something. And it, you know, frankly, it's hogwash. You're not, right? There's a whole industry of them, and you just you either haven't hired them or you haven't given them the freedom to do their job. But what here's what happens, and I, I like to use an illustration again from the sports world to kind of show the 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 craziness of this. So let's say uh, it's the big game. It's football, right? You, you're, it's you know, fourth down. You got four yards to go. There's four seconds left on the clock. You get in. You're down by four. So if you get in, you win. If you don't get in, you lose. Field goal's not going to cut it. You got to make it happen. 
and you've, you you know exactly the play. It's a fake to the running back and a toss to the uh, the wide receiver over the, the shoulder in the end zone, and uh, and so you've done it a thousand times. You know exactly what to do. The, the difference, though, this time is everybody lines up right before the play. The difference is you're not on the field. You're the coach on the sideline. And so you have this, this fear that hits you all of a sudden that says you're not going to touch the ball between now and either victory or defeat. And, and so you're sitting there with that, and you're just hoping that you've trained your, your guys, right? You're hoping that you called the right play. So center hikes the ball, quarterback gets it, fakes to the running back, and it works, right? Defense bites, everyone collapses on the hole thinking that you're going to try and plow ahead. And, and so you're thinking, like, this is awesome. We've done it. And you pan left to your wide, star wide receiver, and you realize they got the play wrong. They're blocking instead of running their route. And you know what's going to happen. It's a timed route. So they're not running now. They're not going to make it. It's not going to work. So what do you do? Your coach on the sideline, you know what you do. You rip your headset off. You chuck your clipboard, hit one of your assistant coaches, and you take off down the line faster than you've ever run in your life. They have no idea how you did it. They're going to study the physics on this for years. But somehow you get to the end zone. You get both feet in bounds. You make the diving catch. You, you hold on to it all the way through. And and what would have been the crowning accomplishment of your career, the celebration, the, what would have made you a hero in your town, right? I'm from Pittsburgh, and we've got the Immaculate Reception. We still talk about it today. What would have been the, the crowning moment of your career is silence. 80,000 people in the stands, and you could hear a pin drop. Nobody knows what to do or what just happened, right? You get us, the only thing that's happening is these little yellow flags start flying in your direction and men in black and white stripes start running at you. What, what would have created success in your past your career as a player on the field is now a violation of about 18 different rules of the game. You crossed that boundary onto the field. You broke the rules of the game. And not only did you ensure your team's defeat, you did it in the most embarrassing possible way for your best players. And that has never happened in the history of professional football, right? Not in a situation like that. But I can tell you, construction industry and, and any industry you pick, it happens every single day with the founders who should be functioning from the, the sidelines, who keep crossing the boundaries, and when they do, they frustrate their leaders, and they almost certainly limit, if not prevent, their victory. Hmm. I love it. I mean, that's right on point. That's what happens when we just come in and take over for whatever reason and just say, hey, now we're the one in charge. And... It completely changes the mindset around everybody on the team because you put somebody in charge and then when they have the opportunity to show up and make something happen, even if a play goes south and then you jump in, it, it completely can ruin their perception on who they are and their confidence. And, and this to me, it, again, it happens in every industry, but it, it is one of the primary reasons why you see two things, why you see so many construction companies sub $10 million, right? Sub $5 million, because they're still trying to pick the whole thing up on their shoulders and carry it forward every single day. It's the second thing is because it's so rare that folks understand what's going on here and make the appropriate change in how they show up as the founder, as the owner, as the leader, as a construction champion, that the return on it when you do is through the roof, right? You'll see folks that if they can get past that $5 million, $10 mark, they can get to 50 to $100 million in half the amount of, of work and energy and effort. The return on this is enormous. And when we keep showing up the way that we always have, when we keep trying to pick up the team and put them on our back, and we pride ourselves on the diving catch, we're not only limiting our own success, we're limiting the potential for every single person in our team. Absolutely, man. I 100% agree with that. I agree with that from past experiences. What you're talking about is 100% true. So, man, it is awesome to have had you on the show today. You are a wealth of knowledge, and I love how you break it down. You just make it super easy. 
to understand. And that to me is awesome. That's your champion in that. Like that is, that matters. Uh, so for all the construction champions out there, if they want to connect with you, learn more about what you do, follow you, where's the best places for them to do that? Yeah. So best place to start, uh, again, put all this in a, a, at what is intentionally a very short book, uh, because, you know, again, if you're dealing with any of these problems, you don't have time to sit there and read some literacy work of wonder. You need answers. Uh, and so I, I break it down. I spend a chapter uh, in, uh, on each of the stages so you can find out what stage you're in. And here's the best part of this. Once you understand what stage you're in, you can go from like the 20 or 30 things you think you need to do today to the two or three things you actually actually need to do today. The you know, early folks who got the book and gave feedback were saving on average 10 hours every single week on stuff that they just didn't have to do. And not only were they not doing that 10 hours of work a week, they were growing faster because of it. So get a copy of the book and get it on our website at scalearchitects.com. If you go to forward slash founders uh, or just click on free book anywhere on the site, you'll be able to get a free copy of it. And uh, so check that out. Find out what stage you're in and you'll find there's just a couple of things you need to do to make a world of difference in your organization. Uh, on the following us, uh, we, we release an enormous amount of content. I wish it was as easy as saying go for Scott Ritzheimer, but I'm a junior, so there's two of us. So look up Scott Ritzheimer. Look for the one who looks like he's 14 years old. That's me. I can't do anything about it. I got a baby face. I just have to admit. But um, the, you know, the beard helps a little bit. Uh, but yeah, look for the one who looks like he's 14 and, and, uh, and connect with me there. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for being on the show today. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. All right, construction champions, another rock star guest. What are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? And, you know, we all know, like, you can answer that right now. Like, as soon as I said that, you had a list of 10 things. What I really want to talk about as we end this episode is, are you taking the glory moments from your guys? You know, when Scott talked, about that fourth down play and the coach running off the field. I have seen that happen so many times. I have done that myself, where we put great people in roles to do great things. But when the time comes, we don't let them be great. Because there's something in us, there's some fear that it's going to go south. And you know, that wide receiver might be there. But if you have faith in your quarterback, your quarterback's going to probably, he probably noticed that before you noticed it as the coach on the sidelines. And he was already making adjustments to figure out how to get in that end zone. When you're not the one there in, in the shotgun, taking on the traffic as the play is developing it and you're watching it from the sidelines, it can still look like chaos but that quarterback can have it completely under control. And if it's the right person and you trust them, let them try to make the play happen. Because the, the outcome, if they fumble the ball or they don't make it in, isn't going to be nearly as bad as if you run out there to save the day. Because it's a lot easier to clean that up and have a conversation with everybody on what to do next time when that happens than try to explain, oh, I didn't trust you guys at all. That's why I went running in there. Like, that's why I took this over and pushed you to the side. That's a lot harder to fix. And chances are you will probably never fix it. Those people will be clocked out and probably looking for employment somewhere else because they have no confidence in their ability. And it's all because you took over in a situation. So I really want everybody to think about that as we end this episode today. So Construction Champions, make sure you go check out our website, check out our blog. And until next time, be the champion you were meant to be. Hey, Construction Champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum here. And I want to talk to you about how you can automate all of your marketing. We've had so many people on here talk about getting the systems in place. Well, we have partnered with Build 12 and Construction Champions podcast. Les O'Hara, the founder, 
What really excites me is his 30 years in the industry. And now he's built a system to be able to nurture your leads and continue to utilize that. I personally use the system myself. Build 12 is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of value in there. And it's a way to start getting away from Angie's list and all of that kind of stuff and start actually creating your own leads every day and have a system for them. So go on our website, check out the show notes, go check out Build 12 and what it can do for the front end of your business today. It's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend going and meeting with Les and his son, Devin, and talking to him about what they built for their own business. So the rest of the industry can take benefit from that. Here on Construction Champions, we're all about helping each other out. And what is better than contractors helping contractors? I say nothing. So let's go take this to the next level. Go check out Build 12. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Les or his son, Devin. We're here to help. We want to continue to grow the industry.